Hello there, I'm Glenn, Glenn Ward, and I'm here to talk to you today about photoelectric photometry. Now, photoelectric photometry is not as popular as it used to be. These days, with all these CCDs and other kinds of digital cameras and you know imaging devices that we have, photoelectric photometry can look a little bit obsolete, but it's really not. Because photoelectric photometry can do things that these other new systems can't do. In particular, amateurs using photometers can measure some of the brightest stars in the skies to some very great accuracy, and they can do it with just very simple equipment that many amateurs already have, except of course for the photometer. Well anyhow, I want to talk a little bit about how photoelectric photometry works. I won't get too detailed or boring, and then I'm going to get out my photometers and show you how they work. I have the two most well-known kinds of photometers. One is an Optech SSP, which is an analog photometer that uses a photodiode, and the other is a Starlight One from Thorny EMI Gemcom, and it uses a photomultiplier tube and is a lot more sensitive, but a lot more trouble too. But first, let's just talk really briefly about how photoelectric photometry works. Now, most of the time, when we're doing photoelectric photometry, we do differential photometry. We don't just measure a star up in the sky, because if we did, the continuing changes in the sky transparency and turbulence in the sky and so forth would cause our measurements to be way off. It might be possible if you were really high up on a mountaintop with a really good sky, you might be able to do that kind of absolute photometry. We can't do that in normal circumstances. What we have to do is we have to do differential photometry. We have to take a known star that we know is um, you know, not variable, we know its magnitude well, we know it's steady, and we take measurements of it, and we take measurements of our target star, which we suspect to be variable, and then we compare the two. So it's differential photometry. Now as I mentioned, the sky plays havoc with any measurements we make. If we make measurements and just do a, you know, a few seconds worth, it's not worth anything. But if we do enough measurements of each thing, of our comparison star and our target star, as well as a little patch of sky with no stars, so we can get a reading for our sky background, we can use some very simple statistics to reduce these numbers and get you know, results that are just absolutely incredible. Very commonly, you'd have results good to a hundredth of the magnitude, and it's not unusual to have results good to a couple thousandths of the magnitude. It kind of depends on your sky conditions, but your conditions don't have to be really great. As long as it's not too bad, as long as your transparency is not varying too much, you can get good results. So what we would do, if we were going to do some photometry, we'd start out with like a little patch of sky where there are no stars, and we take our sky reading, and we go to the comparison star, take a reading, back to the sky, take a reading, over the target, take a reading, back to the sky, and we keep doing this until we had enough integration time on the star, target star in the comparison that we knew we'd get good results. We can use a little simple math out of a book like this to tell us how long, much integration time we need, but it, it's not complicated. I'm making it, I'm, I'm simplifying a little, but only a little. It's, it's really pretty simple. But after we get enough measurements of the sky and the comparison of the target star, what we would then do is we'd average each of those components. And then we'd take the average sky measurement and take it out of the averages for the target and the comparison. And at that point we have those two numbers, which are the measurements of the target and the comparison, with the sky subtracted out. And we can then take those two numbers and put them in a very simple formula that I'll show you in just a minute or two and get the difference between comparison and target. And it's that simple. Photoelectric photometry has a lot of uses, and it's a shame that people have kind of abandoned it. In truth, I don't think the amateurs really got as much out of it as they could. Um, if you go back to the 80s, there was a pretty good push on for amateurs to do photoelectric photometry, but there were never really a lot of people doing it. But it's too bad. It can give great results you can get wonderful results in some of the bright stars. I like to use Betelgeuse. In fact, I'll show you in a second this chart, but this is the chart for Betelgeuse right here. This is the official chart from the AAVSO. 
and you can just do all kinds of wonderful things with a photometer. So I hope that some people will get involved. I've heard from some people from the AVSO that there are some people looking to get back into it, and I hope they do. If I had more time, I'd be up there every night doing it, but I haven't had time to do this for over 10 years. But let me, let's move on a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit, just a little bit about how the charts work, and a tiny little bit about theory, not very much, and then I'll show you my photometer. So the way I handled the charts was that I first print out a rather wide chart using Megastar, which is a wonderful, although now very dated, program. This is my chart set for Betelgeuse, Alpha Orionis, one of my favorite stars to do. This star isn't done very often because it's so bright, and a lot of the various photometry setups people have with CTDs and so forth can't really handle it that well. If you look here, you can see Orion's belt right there. There's Rigel. And there's Betelgeuse. Now, the comparison stars and check stars are going to use it right up here in Orion's head. One of them is called Cad Posterior, or the trailing cheek. I guess it would be the cheek on this side of Orion's face. He's moving this way as the earth turns, of course. Now, looking inside here, here we have the official AAVSO photometry chart. So it shows that area up here. Here's the area of Orion's head. There's Cad Posterior there. We have a check star down here. And Betelgeuse is represented by the crosshairs. And these charts that the AAVSO puts out have your magnitudes listed for your comparison star and your check star. It gives coordinates and so forth too in case you needed them. Yeah, this book here is the most important book on the matter. If you just follow what this book tells you, you can do anything you want to do with a photon counter or a photometer. There are a few things you have to do before you can get right into it. You have to figure out what are called color transform coefficients for your system. It sounds kind of complicated, but it's not. The reality is you can do photoelectric photometry pretty easily if you just follow, follow just a couple things that are in this book and maybe get a little advice from the AABSO. Okay, so here you have that basic formula I mentioned. It just shows that the difference in the stars is equal to negative 2.5 times the base 10 log of the two measurements, what ratio one over the other. It's pretty simple. Here's a reduction from years ago. You can see there where I had my average for the variable and I took out the sky, and then the comp star and I took out the sky, and the check star and I took out the sky. And then down here were the magnitudes that I determined. Okay, so let's have a look at this photometer and see what it's all about. Now this is the Optech SSP3 photometer. It's made by Optech, a company located near Detroit in Michigan. And as you can see, it has a standard one and a quarter inch mount here to go in the focus or the telescope. Now this little thing right here is one of the filter sliders. As you can see, that's a, it's got the blue and the visual, the B and B filters. As you can see, the visual filter is sort of a greenish yellow filter, and that's a pretty broad filter. It makes sense that they put B and B together because those are the two filters you'd most use. After all, you can take B and subtract V and get your co typical color index, right? You can do other ones too, but that's the most common, B minus V. So put it back in there. And here on the other side we have this knob. And this just determines whether the light's going up through the eyepiece or back to the detector. Right now, it's going to the eyepiece, and if you could look in there, you can see a little circle. And that's the reticle we use to center the star up. It needs to be centered. And to use this photometer well, you need to have a, a telescope that's on a pretty heavy polar mount with a good clock drive. Because you cannot have the star drifting around and drifting off, off the detector and so forth. Turn it this way, the light goes straight through. And it goes back to the detector, which in this case is a photodiode made by Hamamatsu in Japan. Hamamatsu is a leading company in, in that field. And although, you know, this works pretty well, I have to admit that the, the detector in this has a lot of sensitivity on the red end and not much on the blue and UV end. 
And that's exactly the opposite, though, of most photometers. Most photometers use a photomultiplier tube, or PMT. And as such, they have a lot of sensitivity on the blue and UV end, and not much on the red end. But even though this is a lot different, it still works pretty well. Now, the quantum efficiency of this detector in here is, is very poor compared to a tube. So you can't use this on stars that are as dim as you could one of the tube models. But in my 10-inch telescope there, I could easily go down to perhaps make magnitude 7.5. I probably could have gone a lot dimmer. There are equations there in that book I'm showing you that can tell you, you know, how much integration time you need to have and so forth, and also how much your signal on the, your comp and, and target stars need to be above the sky to get the legitimate results. But I like to stick with stars that gave me a really good signal-to-noise ratio. Now this right here is where you can get the readout if you want it. You can take that readout and write it down in a notebook. And you can write it down for each measurement and then just take a calculator and add them up. But you can also go through the RS-232 port here and take it into a computer and record the, the uh, measurements automatically. When you're using this, you have different scales. It's almost like a, an amp in there. and You can select, I think, 1 times, 10 times, and 100 times so that you're on the right scale for your brightness of your star. So you're getting preferably getting four digits there. But this little photometer, it's pretty nice. What happened was I had a motorcycle that I hadn't ridden in a long time. It was a nice Honda motorcycle. It was black and chrome. But the last time I took it out, I nearly got run over twice. So I hadn't ridden it for a while. I sold it to a guy from Michigan to get the money to buy this. I never regretted it because this photometer is exceptionally well made. This is all metal, machined, yeah, you know, this is made in America and it's really nice to made. Like I say, it's made by Optech Incorporated and they're located up near Detroit and it's a really nice photometer. Okay, so I'm going to run upstairs and grab my other photometer. It's more of a traditional photometer. It has a PMT tube in it and you might even call it a photon counter. It has a little computer of its own that connects to it, and it's a pretty neat item. Not too many of these are in the world. So I'll go up there and grab that, and then we'll have a look at it. Okay, so now here we're here, and we're looking at my Starlight One photometer setup. These were made back in the early 80s by Thorn EMI Gencom. It's an English company, but I believe these were made in New Jersey. Now this one here, you see, we have a photon head, photon counting head that hooks into the computer. Now, this is a Rockwell 6502 based computer. It does a lot of different things. And look, check this out. This is just so 70s. We even have a remote on a giant cable. Okay, hard to believe. You got start and stop right there. Some of the stuff, I mean, clock, display ID. This thing is so capable. It can do so much. You can do high speed photometry, like when you have a, um, say a star or an asteroid that's being occulted by the moon, maybe a star being occulted by an asteroid. It can do high-speed photometry on that. This is a delicate system though. It's uh, very easy to screw it up. You would never want to turn it on with the lights on. Now, if you take a look at the photon counting head. Back here we have a standard one and a quarter inch barrel. Put it up on the telescope. This thing I don't know how heavy it is, maybe 10 pounds, I don't know. You definitely want to be cautious with this thing to make sure it doesn't slide right out of the telescope. On this one, we center the star up in a reticle just like we did in the other one by looking through here. This one though has different apertures. As you turn this, these little brass discs with holes in them fall into place. And usually you'll start with the biggest one, which is real big, center the star up as best as you can and move down through the apertures and try and get it centered up in the smallest aperture. This right here is the, the knob that flips between viewing and sending the incoming light to the tube. This one uses a tube that's about the same as the original photometry tube, which was an RS, RCA 1P21 tube. The only difference is the, tube, the original tube, the RCA, was about this big, and the tube in this one is much smaller, but it has about the same response as the one that Mr. Johnson used originally for his Johnson system. So this is a very capable photometer. 
This here just adjusts the brightness of the red LED that lights up the apertures. This one has the full Johnson system filters in it as well. There's blue and B, red, infrared, open, and UV. As I mentioned before, this, the response of this tube in here, this PMT tube, is, is much different from the response of the other photometer. This tube in here is very sensitive to the blue and the UVN, but in the red, it won't do much at all. But uh, the nice thing about this is, it's very much the standard. The response of the tube is very much the standard, just like Mr. Johnson used. So this photometer gets really great results with very little additional math, besides just the little formula I showed you there out of the book. This telescope was the main telescope I used for photometry. It's a Vixen 260. It's basically a Cassegrain type telescope. And the reason it was good wasn't because of the optic. It's all mechanical. See here? You mount something on there, it's going to stay put. The focusing of this telescope is entirely internal. So nothing here moves back and forth. You can mount stuff on good and tight, and it's not going to go anywhere. I also had this telescope equipped with a couple of finders. This right angle finder right here was indispensable. Now this was the finder I used to center the stars out to get them into the field of view of the photometer. The nice thing about this finder is it's a right angle finder but it gives a correct image. It's not mere reversed. So it made it very easy to work with the charts. It just has a crosshair in the eyepiece there. I bought this finder long ago. It didn't cost very much. It was made in Taiwan. It's a 50 millimeter diameter finder though and it has an excellent view through it. Um, all the little stars that were visible in that chart I just showed you I could see in this finder and we could very easily make sure we were getting the right one. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this little look at photoelectric photometry. I didn't want to get too detailed and bore anybody with the math. It's not that complicated. People are always asking me about PEP. People are always wanting to buy my photometers. Just recently I heard from the AAVSO that they like they have some people that would like to buy them. But they're out of luck because I'm not going to part with them, ever. The photometers are really great pieces of equipment. It's a wonderful thing to do. You get so much out of it. It's just, it just it gives you a great feeling. Especially when you complete that little formula I showed you. And it all comes out and you look and maybe you compare it to somebody else's measurement or whatever. And you realize your measurement is exactly right. It's just incredible what you can do with this equipment. So anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's the first one I've made. I'm going to make more and I'm sure I'll get better at it as I go along. I've had, been at astronomy for many, many years and have a lot of things to talk about. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.